Welcome everyone to this very special conversation with master storyteller Michael Morpurgo. Sir Michael Morpurgo, I should say. Uh, Michael will do. <laughs> on the occasion of the centenary of the armistice. Yeah. Uh, which leads in nicely to my first question. Um, given that it is the armistice centenary, why do you think it's important that children learn about war, read about war? Because it's out there. Um, it was out there then and we all know it's out there now. Part of our problem really is that we've all been brought up post-war into a world of um, security and certainly the expectation that everything's going to be all right, it will be a world without war. And the more we see of the world out there, the more we realise that wars are going on all the time. And the children will have glimpses of, I'm not say they're, they're not going to be looking at these programmes for long, but they will see glimpses of bombed houses in Syria and children being carried off to hospital. So they'll know this stuff goes on. They may not know how far away it is from home, um, but they'll know that it's it's what a lot of families in this world are living through. So to go back to a time in the First World War and the Second World War, particularly the First World War now, when a country was completely plunged into war, everyone in society was involved in this war, at home and abroad. So the, the women were looking after the children, they were working in the factories, they were keeping the farms going, and the men were off there doing the fighting and the women were doing the nursing. Everyone was involved in this thing and the losses were huge. So in a way it's a metaphor for um, the destruction that a war can inflict on society then. And it's a, th a history lesson that it can happen again and that we mustn't forget it. And neither we must we forget therefore those people who um, left this country and were fighting against a a power that wanted to take over uh, Europe and invade England, if it could, and they had to be stopped. And those young men uh, went off and, and did their best. We can think what we like about the justification for the war now, but those, most of those young men came home, but close on a million didn't. Mm -hmm. So they never uh, had the life I've had of um, growing up, uh, having a family of my own, being a father, being a grandfather, great-grandfather, all that was denied to them, the fulfilment of all your hopes and dreams, they didn't have. And what did they die for? In my view, they died, yes, they died because they had to win that war. Why? Because they wanted to stop the advance of tyranny and keep our freedoms, uh, and they wanted to keep their families at home safe. Um, so that's why we must remember it now because it's a lesson for us. And you, um, you've mentioned that we live in a post-world, post-war world. You um, lived in a very immediate way in a post-war world in that you were playing in yes. bomb craters in London when you were a child. I think my particular generation, I'm mid-70s now, um, did grow up with the shadow of this war all around it and the effects of the war all around it. When we saw that physically, we saw it in the, yes, in the buildings in which we did, you know, we did make the most wonderful playgrounds. There's no doubt about that. You had the house I lived next door to in a place called Field Beach Gardens in London um, had been bombed. And if you go along the street now, you can see all the, most of the houses are fine. And then you'll come to this block of new flats. Mm -hmm. And that was my playing place. And it was wonderful because you could climb through the fence and you could go down into what had been the basements of the houses and you could make dens down there and you could climb the walls and do bird nesting and you could, you could play at war. And that's what we did a lot. We killed an awful lot of Germans in those ruins. I mean, it was, that was the world we grew up in. And then when you went to down the corner of the street to get your groceries or your sweets or whatever, there was always a man sitting outside and he did have one leg with a trouser leg curled up. And there was a little Jack Russell puppy, I think it was, I know it was a small terrier, who would sit very, very close to the hat in which you were supposed to put money, which I never dared do because the dog was too close. Um, but he had his medals up always, and I knew this was an old soldier, so bit by bit by bit, you realised that this building had been knocked down, that someone had lost his, his leg, there was a photograph of the family of 
uh, on the family mantelpiece at home in the sitting room of an uncle of mine who was killed in the Second World War. And my mother cried a lot about that. And all that I knew was very, very important. I didn't really understand about the loss until I was about seven or eight, I suppose, it was bit by bit by bit. All these things added up to war being this really destructive, this destructive sort of typhoon which hits a country. And in my case, and in many, many cases, it also wrecked the family because mm -hmm. my father went off to the war and he did come back, but when he came back, my mother had taken up with another soldier. So I had a stepfather, so the family was split up and this happened again and again and again. So it split families, it knocked buildings down, it removed legs, it killed uncles, and you bit by bit you realise that it was this dreadful, dreadful thing. And um, so you grew up with the story of that, the myth of that in your head, and I suppose it's not surprising all these years later that I've written quite so many books about the effect of war on all of us. Speaking of War Horse, what, what was your first inspiration for that book, for writing about the First World War, which no one in children's books was writing about at that time? I think the reason I dared to do it at all, I mean, I've explained a little bit about the, um, the way I'd grown up with this atmosphere of war all around me, post-war England. And, but in a sense, I put that to the back of my mind. I was a teacher, primary school, and uh, I, did, I had told a lot of stories to uh, the children in class, year six class it was. Uh, never about war at all. I just hadn't gone there. I did write one story called Friend or Foe, mm -hmm. which is a story that my auntie, my auntie Bess, who was a teacher in London, um, evacuated her children from Islington down to Cornwall. And it was a story really of a couple of evacuee uh, children. Um, so that was really because of the stories that she was telling me about her experiences being a teacher. So I'm I thought that would interest the children. I was interested myself in, in the way children leave home and family in a very traumatic situation and then are taken to live on a farm, which is supposed to be um, sort of all heavenly and isn't it wonderful, green fields, and, mm -hmm. and actually you just walk into all sorts of other problems of the local children, and yeah. uh, et cetera. So I did that. And I had no intention, really, of writing a book about the First World War, but moved to Devon about 40, 40 plus years ago now, a tiny village, 100 people, and I was told quite soon afterwards there were two or three old men who lived in the village, octogenarians, who um, had been to the First World War. And I met them, I talked to them at the, I know, the village fete or the produce show or something. And then I just met one of them by accident, a chap called Wilf Ellis in the pub one day. And I um, started talking to him and I, I just sort of broached the subject. I, I said to him, I gather you were in the First World War, Wilf, and he said, he said, yep. He didn't say anything else, which is quite common mm -hmm. um, where I live. People are really sweet and really kind, but talking is not mm -hmm. what they do easily. And so I questioned him a bit, a tiny bit, and I said, uh, how old were you, 19? I was there with horses. And then he just started talking, and he never stopped for an hour and a half, took me down to his cottage, showed me photographs of his pals, some alive, some dead, showed me his trenching tool. He was a man of about 80. And his wife said, um, he's just never talked to me about this stuff at all. So it goes to what you just said before. You don't tell those who are near and dear to you all about these dreadful things. But he was gassed. Uh, he had his life spared by a German soldier who could have bayoneted him and didn't, and he never knew why. And he survived the war and came back and the end, you know, by the time I knew him, he was an antique dealer. And from him, this is what's bizarre, I one day bought a picture um, of a horse in a stable and underneath there was this name, Topthorn. So he was the one who first told me about taking horses to the war. Mm. And then he sold me the picture with the name of Topthorn, which is a, the name of um, Joey's friend in, in my book. So. Yes, he got it all going, and then it was research. It was ringing up the, the, the um, Imperial War Museum in London and asking them the question about horses. So I said, I, I thought roughly a million men had been lost in the war. How many horses? And the man on the end of the phone said, well, roughly the same. We know about a million horses went, and we know 65,000 came back. So we're talking roughly the same numbers. And then, of course, you were thinking on the end of the phone, well, these horses died. The same way as the men, they died on the wire, they were drowned in the mud, they were machine gunned, they died of disease, 
and they uh, very often died of depression too. I mean, the horses suffer from all the same things yeah, we suffer yeah. from. And, um, and then it occurred to me, tell a story, not from a French point of view or a British point of view or a German point of view, tell it through the eyes and feelings of a horse who moves from one side to the other. Circumstances, um, the circumstance I invented was it's a farm horse in my village of Iddesley. It grows up on a farm with a young boy and is, um, the army comes to the village at the beginning of the war to buy horses and horses sold away against the boy's wishes. And he follows the horse to France. And uh, in France, the horse is captured by the Germans, so lives the war partly with British soldiers, mm -hmm. partly with German soldiers, and then also winters on a French farm. So you see the war from other points of view besides one side. So it's a story of the universal suffering of war, which is what I'd come to realize was the important thing to focus on. Are any of the characters in your war books based on real people, specific real people? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I'm going to grab this one here, if I'm allowed to. Of course. Well, it's my book. It's it? yours, it's of course. Um, sort of. I discovered um, that there's an extraordinary man who, again, most people have never heard of this man. It's called Walter Tull. Um, and Walter Tull was the first uh, black officer uh, in the British Army. And um, his name should be right up there in terms of, I suppose, the way society has changed, because he was, an, if you like, an early pioneer of being black and accepted as being a valuable citizen in this country way, way back. Not only that, he was a formidable footballer. Um, I mean, the man played for Arsenal, um, and he, again, had to suffer, as a lot of these people did then, the most dreadful racial abuse as when he trotted out onto a, f a field. Um, and he shrugged it off, never complained about it, he just went on doing it, and he became much, much loved. Um, shall I read you a tiny bit of it? Do you mind? Please, please All right. Do. This is about this little boy. He was in, in an orphanage, and this is how he became a footballer, and eventually, um, we get to know him a bit better, but through this, by the time Leroy's voice broke, he was out of the orphanage, apprenticed to a carpenter and playing football for his local side. Whenever he played, wherever he played, he was still the wizard. The name stuck with him and stayed. Home supporters loved him. But when they played away, the crowd would sometimes call him all manner of horrible things from the terraces. But that only made him play all the harder to win to make them eat their words. He had found his way of getting back at them. He had an offer to play for the Arsenal the week before the war broke out, in August 1914 it was. In the newspapers they called him the Wonder Wizard of Walworth. He'd soon be playing not just for the Arsenal, but for England too, they wrote. He was that good. But all his football, footballing pals were joining up, everyone in the team. There were posters all around, everywhere you looked. Your country needs you, for king and country. Leroy was swept along on a tide of enthusiasm, patriotism and optimism, as they all were, as I was too, the whole country was. He knew he had to go where and when his country called. It was his duty. Leroy stuck with his pals, his football team. They all joined up together and went off across the channel to fight. So Leroy never played for the Arsenal, nor for England either. By the time I met him that day in the cafe in Paparinga only a few months later, Seven of the football team who joined up with him were already dead. And the only forward left, Leroy told me, but I can run faster than any of them. Dodge and duck and dive, you should see me. No Fritz bullet's going to catch me. You'll see. Anyway, that's a sort of introduction to him. Unfortunately, he did die. Uh, he was um, one of the... 400,000 soldiers killed or wounded in the 16-day-long Battle of the Somme. And um, no one knows where he's buried. It's listed. If you go to uh, there's a memorial at Arras in France, and his name's up there, Walter Tal. But he was um, extraordinary. His grandmother had been a slave in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and he had a Barbadian father and an English mother who died when he was a little boy. So he was one of the very earliest black people who um, people realised was extraordinary. And um, 
that changes people's views. And that's wonderful. He was a pioneer mm. in all sorts of ways. So that's why I wrote the book. It's called A Medal for Leroy. Um, and I love the book dearly. And he, he displayed great heroism in the war as well, didn't he? he Huge had, heroism. The title yeah. Well, of the book. it was one of the reasons they had to make him an officer. He went up there as a regular soldier, but he was so brave and did so many good things that he was recommended by his company commander to be an officer. But they just wrote his name down, Walter Tull, and the name was sent back to England. I'm recommending him to be an officer. And then he turned up as an officer training course. And they looked at him and thought, oh, because they hadn't seen a black man on an officer training course before, but he was there. So then you couldn't turn him away. So he became an officer because he was so good at what he did and it was undeniable. Um, and that's rather wonderful. Mm. And more recently you wrote um, Eagle in the Snow, which is yes. inspired by an extraordinary true story. That again, not many people know. Well, that's what I know, is the discover the discovery, of, just for me, it's not, it's not because it's a wonderful thing to do, it's just suddenly you tumble upon these stories. Um, and it's a man called Henry Tandy, um, who, an extraordinary thing happened to him, really. He was um, the most decorated private soldier, that means a soldier with no rank, and, except private, mm -hmm. so the lowest of the low, Field Marshal at the top, generals, and all these colonels and brigadiers, and right down the the private soldiers. These are the ones who mostly got killed. Anyway, Henry Tandy um, was an extraordinary uh, young man, really, because he was um, he was utterly fearless. Um, no one could quite understand. Whenever anything was needed, uh, and someone was lying wounded in no man's land, he simply wouldn't think twice. He'd go out and fetch him back in again. And he was wounded again and again and again. But they never killed him, and he just kept doing these things. And he was always the first to charge into um, an attack. And he, he was promoted to corporal, but he didn't want to be. So he said, no thanks, he stayed private. And then right towards the end of the war, when our side, the Allies as they were called, that's the, the British and the French and the Americans and the Canadians and everyone were pushing the Germans back, there was an extraordinary action that took place. Um, as they were going forward, some Germans were fighting very bravely and um, dying in large, large numbers. And uh, Henry Tandy was with his company of soldiers, and uh, there was a German machine gun firing at them. And so he, Tandy did what he always did. He sort of got up and thought, well, I'll sort that lot out. And he threw grenades and he ran forward, and he killed many, many Germans and took many of them prisoner. Uh, and there was a lot of noise of the battle, a lot of smoke. Um, but the Germans weren't resisting anymore. And through the smoke, he suddenly saw this German soldier on his own, looking very dazed, walking towards him. And all the other, all his friends put up their rifles as if they're going to shoot him. And Hans said, no, no, don't. He said, we've done enough, we've done enough. He's not. And he called the guy over and they met face to face. And Dandy told him to drop his rifle down. And uh, they couldn't speak, he couldn't speak any German. So I don't know what language he used, but it was something like, go home, Fritz. And he waved him away. But the two men had looked at each other across quite a short distance. And that was the end of it. The war ended, and for that action, he won a Victoria Cross which is the highest decoration mm -hmm. you can get in the British Army. And um, he went to receive the medal from the, the king at Buckingham Palace after the war was over, and then he went back to Coventry where he lived and went back to his factory and led a quiet life. He didn't play the hero, he didn't want any press or publicity, he just wanted to go back to out and get on with his life. Sadly, he couldn't, because many years later, they started, the story came out in the 1930s when Adolf Hitler was Chancellor of Germany. He put it about that his life had been spared by a British Tommy in the First World War. And he knew the name because he'd seen a picture of Tandy receiving his medal. And he'd been shown it clearly by his advisors who said, I know this man Tandy, 
um, saved my life. And of course, the press came knocking on his door and said, "You've just saved the life. You saved the life of Adolf Hitler." And no one liked Adolf Hitler already. He, we weren't at war by this time. Um, and then, of course, later on, we were. And the first thing he wanted to do was to join up um, again. And he was told he couldn't. He'd been wounded too badly. Um, and so this was the man who, with one bullet, mm. could have stopped the Second World War from happening. Because without any question, the Second World War happened because of Adolf Hitler. He was the one who motivated those kind of people in Germany at the time to become Nazis, to do what they did. And if he had pulled his trigger that day, or allowed the others to pull theirs, there would have been no Adolf Hitler. And so I wrote a story around that. And I called it An Eagle in the Snow. Mm. And in your story, he tries to make it right, doesn't he? he? He tries to make it right, but I didn't think I'd do... I think you can do these things called spoilers, can't you? <laughs> you can say too much, and I didn't really know where to stop in the telling of the tale. No, there is a point at which, and I've done this with all my books, really, there's a point at which some of them are absolutely true. I've just written a story, uh, as mm -hmm. it happens, called In the Mouth of the Wolf, which is completely true from beginning to the end. In this case, the man is absolutely true. What he did mm -hmm. uh, is true. But then I take the story a step further, and I tend to do that. I think I grew up as a child loving to tell stories, and the more risky they were to tell, the more I liked telling them. When you tell them out loud, they're called lies. <laughs> and um, I was a good little liar at school. I really was very, very good, mostly to keep myself out of trouble. Um, but I, but I, it's always based on truth, and we all know, mm. actually, when you tell a lie, mm. um, and I'm not advocating that we should uh, say it shouldn't tell lies. It's not a good idea. Really wrong. <laughs> However, just a little hint for you that if you're going to tell a lie, keep most of it true. Mm. And that way people will believe it. And then once they believe it, you can tell them anything. Mm. You know. <laughs> A recipe for storytelling. I think you better cut that Michael out. There'll be, all sorts of, there'll be all sorts of trouble. The scissors are coming out already. <laughs> Am I right in remembering that Hitler kept the evening standard framed on his no, wall of his office. No, it wasn't that. What Hitler did, he, this is all, all completely true. He, at some stage, um, one of his advisors in England discovered there was a painting of Henry Tandy carrying a oh, wounded soldier it. into a hospital in northern France after that very battle where he'd done this. And it was in the officer's mess up in Yorkshire uh, of a regiment up there called the Green Howards. And he, they sent a military attaché out there. This is when we were at peace. And they said, could we make a copy of this? Because our chancellor would um, like a copy. So they made a copy. And it hung on his wall at his house up in the mountains called the Berkers Garden. And when Neville Chamberlain, in 1938, uh, our prime minister, flew across to try and make a peace with Hitler, Hitler took him by the arm and showed him this picture and said, that's Henry Tandy. He's the man who saved my life. And that's, that's the story. Now, the problem with all these stories is you're not quite sure mm. um, how true it is. Because what, what um, was supposed to have happened is that Chamberlain came back with a message for Henry Tandy and tried to ring him up. That's where I feel the story falls apart a bit, because most people didn't have phones no. in their houses in those days. So in, I think he phoned him at work. Workers, he phoned so. him at work. That's what he did. Anyway. You, so you don't know, and that's, I don't mind that. I love, because all history is to some extent, if we don't really know, I and mean, we know when the kings are born, the kings die. But for instance, if a king has been killed in a battle, we don't know, we don't know who killed mm -hmm. Richard III. You can make a good mm -hmm. story up about who did, but we don't know. Um, and what's lovely about Richard III, for instance, is that sometimes you learn more about, centuries later, you know more about what actually happened even more than Shakespeare did, and he wrote a play about him. And I rather love that. Yeah. And we must remember when we're talking about history and inventing stories around um, history, um, which is always on the cusp of legend and, and myth. Um, I mean, I've just come back from Greece, from this island called Ithaca, uh, where a great writer, a man called Homer, told the story really of the fall of Troy and of the journey home of the great Odysseus it took 10 years, and he had this adventure and that adventure. Uh, but all the places are there, all the places that he landed, all his friends and the war in Troy and the wooden horse, it's all there. Um, and we know Troy was there, and we know it was roughly the right date. So he, he may have been mostly right. The gods played a big part in that too, yeah. which is a, 
Uh, you know, we can always talk about that. But the way you use stories in history is up to the writer. A fairly decent writer called Shakespeare did this again and again and again in his history plays. Um, and, you know, he, he, he took history and he twisted it. And sometimes to his own purpose. Well, that's fine. Private Peaceful yeah. is a particularly moving novel, one of the few books to have blinded me with tears, I think, at the end of that book. Was that um, bad, was it? <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking as an editor, my goodness, this book, he should never have written it. No, I think it's, I think it's an extraordinary book. I think it's your, your masterpiece. Um, but what, what inspired you to write that one? Um, that, again, was... Um, a truth, a happening, it's always a happening. In this case, I was invited to uh, Ypres in Belgium, which is very important in, in, because it was a, there was a huge battle around this little town in Belgium, um, which many, many people on both sides died. And it was a place that the British had to defend, and the Belgians and the French, because if the Germans had broken through there, they could have um, come to the Channel ports, and it would have been very serious. So they had to hold that particular city. There's a museum there now called In Flanders Field, and I went there with a good friend of mine, Michael Foreman, who has illustrated many of my uh, my stories, particularly my stories about war. Because there was a conference about writing about war for young people in this extraordinary museum, and uh, I remember walking through it and coming out the other end of it. And Michael had gone on ahead of me, and I was in tears because it was it's the most powerful evocation of the suffering of war on all sides. That's what the museums, you find out as much about the Germans and the Belgians and people from New Zealand and India and Africa, all these people who came to take part in this world war. The, it, it's all there, the whole thing. And it's painful. And I was just about to leave and I came across this letter in a frame and read it. It was just a typed letter which said, we regret to inform you that your son, Private So-and-so, was shot at dawn for cowardice on such and such a day, 1916, and it was signed by a lieutenant. And there was a little envelope above it, and the envelope was addressed to, I think it was a mother in, somewhere in Salford, Manchester. And you could see where it had been opened, because the envelope was flattened out. And you could see the rip. Mm. And you knew that what opening that envelope what that mother must have dreaded, that this is how you received news of your son's death. So she'd have dreaded it anyway. So she opens it and she finds out that he'd been shot at dawn for cowardice, which is, at the time, unbelievably shameful. So that family's life would have been wrecked forever. And then I asked the man who ran the museum, how common was that? And he said, well, over 300 uh, British and Allied soldiers were shot for cowardice or desertion. Two of them were shot because they fell asleep on sentry duty. And then he showed me some of the trials of these people, and you realise that there was very little justice. This was all to do with setting an example. Um, so there are in proportionate there were far too many Irish soldiers shot, and there was a good reason for that politically. And far too many um, black soldiers were shot in proportion to the number that there were. So you knew something wasn't right. That there, when you read these trials, it was very evident they were just seeking an excuse to execute them, to make sure that other people didn't do the same thing. They didn't run away, they didn't disobey orders. And then you read accounts of what happened on the last night, and the fact that they were always alone, or usually alone, sometimes in some barn, sometimes in a prison cell. And then the cruelest thing of all, in a way, is that they very often made the people who were the friends of the man shoot him, so they'd be the firing squad. So I thought, well, this story needs telling. It's unbelievably cruel. I knew there was a whole movement of families of these people who were still trying to persuade the government, even then, 20 years ago, that these men should be pardoned, that they had not had a fair mm -hmm. trial, and they'd have been refused, 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 refused. So anyway, I wrote this story and I decided to tell it during the last night, just before an execution. And what you don't know in the book is um, whether the brother, 
is the person who's going to be shot um, or the one telling the story. You just don't know until the very last moment. Um, and every chapter is not a chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. It's it, it's the time mm. as the night goes through until dawn, and they're always shot at six o'clock in the morning. So yeah, it um, it was a painful book to write, um, but I've never regretted it in the sense that it it provided, I think, um, yet another um, reason for the families to take heart that there were people out there who thought this was a, a cruel injustice. And um, I wrote to people as well. I wrote to Mrs. Blair. Um, other people were doing the same. And, uh, but I think it was wonderful at a certain moment when the government did decide um, that these men should be pardoned, that the play of Private Peace for Laurent was on um, in Trafalgar Square, which is just along from the Houses of Parliament. And I rather liked that. So I hope it made a small contribution to righting a wrong that it could never take away the suffering of both the people concerned and their families, of course. And um, I know the, there's an origin there, which is very, very strange. I, I remember th going back to Ypres to go back to the museum later when I was writing the book, and I still hadn't found the name of my soldier. Um, I can't remember what I called him in the first draft. But um, we oh, went... you'd written a draft. Yes, with a... Yeah, I yeah. never knew that. I'd written, written a draft, and I, I really can't remember the name of it now. Anyway, Private Smith or. <laughs> Private question mark. But what I did was to, by pure luck, I always make a point when I go back to Ypres of never just going in and going to a hotel and having a good meal. Uh, you need to almost remind yourself why you're there. And there are many, many, many cemeteries you can visit and indeed should visit. And I always go to one. And the one that we chose that day was on the road into Ypres, about three miles outside. There's a place called the Bedford Cemetery. And we parked the car. And Claire and I got out and just walked into the drizzle. It was very gloomy. And um, we weren't looking for names at all. And she stopped and said, oh, look, I think this is, a, this is extraordinary. And there was this private peaceful written on this gravestone. And his date of uh, his age and date of death and so I thought, well, that would be the most extraordinary name. Mm -hmm. So we went to the, back to the museum afterwards and said, do we have any record ends that anyone interested in this particular soldier? And the manager of the museum said, not as far as we know. So I took the name and used him as my... The two brothers are called Peaceful. And then it was fine. Then at one point, the family, and there is a family, um, realised that the name had been spelt wrong. And I don't think even they asked for it to be put right, but the War Graves Commission decided that because there are so many people now who come to see that grave, mm. a lot of school parties go out there, um, having read Private Peaceful, which of course is not the grave of Private Peaceful, yes. it's simply the name. Yeah. It's a, in a way, what's wonderful is that they have a name of their unknown soldier. Yes. And their unknown soldier has been real to them because of the book that they've read. So there's a mixture of fact and fiction. Mm. And so they come and they it, it is, and they come and put wreaths there, and they put they come and put letters. So I think people thought, well, actually, we've got to put this right. And so the other day, I went out to Belgium only about three or four uh, weeks ago, and they had made a new gravestone with two L's, which is his proper name. Peaceful. Peaceful. Yes. And so I know what will happen now. The kids will come along and they'll look at it and say, Michael Morpurgo can't even spell. <laughs> so it'll rebound one way or the other. Ships and shipwrecks feature mm -hmm. quite prominently in your books. Um, can you talk a bit about Listen to the Moon and yeah. the, the maritime tragedy that inspired that book? I think it's one of these um, subjects that I'm very fascinated by but have very little experience of, rather like war. Um, I mean... I travelled on boats, I potter around in boats, um, I live by a river, so water is there mm -hmm. in my life. I go on holiday at the Isles of Scilly every year. So, yes, the sea is there, islands are there, but I've never been a proper sailor. And I think with, with Listen to the Moon, it started with a place. A lot of my books do start with a place. 
um, which has always fascinated me and in some ways horrified me. If you go to the Isles of Scilly, um, there are literally 50 or 60 little islands around. About five of them are now occupied with people, populated. And there's one particular island which is uninhabited, but there's a house on it. And it's a weird house. It's known as the Pest House. It's an island called St Helens. It's tiny, just a few rocky, pebbly beaches and some um, bracken. You could walk round it in, in the space of half an hour. Tiny. Seals on the, on the rocks and lots of gulls. And the gulls occupy the island. You, you, you land on this beach in a boat and there's this ruin of a house, really, gaping windows, and the gulls watching you from every rock. They'll watch you. This is our island, they're telling you. And they're on the chimney pot, this uh, empty house, this pest house. And what this building was, years and years ago, there's a horrible story behind it, and that is that when the sailing ships were coming in, if they had had some disease on board, um, and it was very, very catching, they knew perfectly well they couldn't take the ship into Falmouth, into a Portsmouth or into a harbour because they wouldn't be allowed to come in and dock. So what they did is they took these people who were sick, 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 and they put them on this island, um, sometimes with a doctor but mostly not, uh, to recover or usually not to recover. And that's why it was called the Pest House. So it's a place for sick, sick people actually to, to die. And so it's got a very, very strange atmosphere. Um, and I'd never thought of using it in the story, but I kind of had this notion that one day I would. It sort of settled in my mind. And then, I suppose not long after going to the Scilly, often I went to the south of Ireland to do a book festival mm -hmm. at a place called Kinsale. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that it was just off Kinsale Head that one of the great events, and actually most important events, most people don't realise it, of the First World War took place. Because there was a great and very beautiful ship um, called the Lusitania, which in 1915 was sailing from New York, I think, to Liverpool, with about 2,000 people on board, mostly civilians, some soldiers, and it was one of these awful happenings, which it should never have happened. The problem was that there was a law of the sea then that you didn't attack a ship that was... Um, if, it, it was if it was carrying uh, munitions, or indeed if it was supplying the UK, um, then the Germans could sink it. That was, but what you didn't do is to sink passenger ships. The British claimed that the Lusitania was just carrying passengers. The Germans said, no, 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 we know it's carrying arms and ammunition, rifles, bullets, we know this. And they even put an advertisement in a paper in New York before the ship left saying, do not get on board this ship because it is being used by the British for armaments and therefore is a legitimate target for our submarines. No one paid any attention to it. Uh, they got on board the ship and it sailed very nice crossing apparently for four days, beautiful calm seas. And 12 miles off Kinsale Head, a German submarine spotted the ship and um, put one torpedo uh, into the ship. And it sank unbelievably fast, unbelievably fast. The Titanic, sort of the, a similar size ship, mm took three hours to sink. This sank in minutes. So the loss of life was terrible. Um, now this was seen from the shore by the people of Kinsale. This is what I learned down there. And they all got in their little boats and they rowed out and rowed out. And they really had rowing boats. They had to go 12 miles mm -hmm. out to sea in a rowing boat. It took hours. But they got there and picked up some survivors um, and lots of bodies. Awful lot of people died. Well over a thousand people died. And the extraordinary thing is there was this one report which fascinated me completely, which was that they discovered floating on the sea the top of the piano from the dining room of the ship. And lying on that was a child. It didn't say in the report a boy or girl. It didn't say it was alive or dead. It was just there. So I thought that image just really stuck in my mind. 
And then what you do is you work out a backstory. Why was that child on that ship? Why were they traveling to England in wartime and taking this risk? Um, so I made up a backstory that they were Canadian, that the father was already at the front, that had been wounded, who was in hospital in England, so mother and daughter were coming across to visit him. So there was a kind of a link there to the, to the First World War. Anyway, that's how the story begins, and what did happen a fair bit at that time in the First World War is that there were some German submarine captains who were very merciful, particularly if people were struggling to live in the water. And in my story, uh, a submarine comes along, comes up, and there's this girl on the piano, and they take her, they rescue her, and they put her in the submarine, but then they don't know what to do with her. <laughs> and the nearest land is the Isles of Scilly. So they take her to the Isles of Scilly, and from the sea they can see this house. And they will put her on that island, she'll be safe. So they row her onto the island, they leave her, thinking it's an inhabited island, she'll be looked after. So that's how the whole thing links up. And to go back to the story of what the Germans said, for years and years and years, the sinking of the Lusitania was, um, it was a really big mistake by the Germans because on board were hundreds of American citizens. And America was neutral, mm -hmm. time. they weren't in the war. And there was a, the British wanted them to come in, they needed their men, they needed their armaments, and the Americans were staying out of it. It's your problem, you Europeans, you get on and kill yourselves. We're staying out of it. But now the Germans had killed hundreds of American citizens. And from that moment on, the tide turned in America in terms of opinion. So that in 1917 um, and 18, the Americans came into the war, and without them, the war would unquestionably not have been won. So it was a sort of a changing moment. And then years and years and years later, in the 1960s, divers went down on the wreck of the Lusitania. And what did they find? Arms and ammunition. Mm -hmm. So what we were trying to do was to smuggle those things mm -hmm. in under the nose of the Germans. So the Germans had been right. They had not been right to sink the ship and kill all those people, mm -hmm. that's for sure. But what they had claimed had been right. So it's just, and I wanted really to... And there are still sealed files about it. There are, sealed yes. Sealed governmental there, there, files. Yes, there really are. In the it's national it. interest. So. Very much so. And, um, well, and it, lies are told in war by, by, by all sides. That's, that is sort of, I'm afraid, part of the, the game, the propaganda of war, that's for sure. Um, but it was one of those dreadful, dreadful tragedies. And the people who died on that ship were just, you know, mostly innocent people. Mm. You write a lot about the relationship between animals and people in your books. Why do you think that connection is so special in books like The Butterfly Lion? Well, I suppose I have an underlying belief in um, that we are simply one of the sentient creatures who inhabit this planet. Uh, we happen to have become the master race and manipulate and exploit and use up other species that are here. But actually, um, we function the same way most of them do. We struggle to survive. Um, we feed ourselves, we procreate, and then we die. And we are sentient. We have a certain intelligence. And all the, these creatures, from plants, from amoeba up to them, they have, a, they, have, they have their own levels of intelligence mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. understanding of the world about them. And we are very sophisticated, which is uh, we have developed that sophistication through all sorts of things. Um, so I think we're one of our fellow creatures, not separate from it, which I know is not necessarily what a lot of religions think. A lot of religions seem to have put us on a pedestal and that God has made this whole thing for us to use up. Well, I kind of don't think that happened. I don't believe it. I believe we're one of them, and I believe we've got enormously strong links with them. So they feel pain, like we do. So take a horse, for instance. Um, anyone who's been near a horse knows it knows fear. Uh, it knows irritation. If you watch a fly land on a mm -hmm. horse's uh, back and the skin shake and the tail swishes, uh, they, we do the same thing with a fly. We have all sorts of responses like that. If you hit a horse and it hurts, it'll cry out, just like we do. There's so many things that are the same. And what you realize is that we, you can make relationships based on our sameness, 
You can make relationships with them. I've witnessed it. I have a, had a lucky thing in my life in that my wife started this charity, Farms for City Children, 40 years ago. And since then, literally tens of thousands of children have been down to the farm, our farm where we live, on the land all around us. And I've worked with them for 25 years of my life with animals. So I've seen children and animals in close proximity. Children often, to start with, if they're re really quite old, 11, 12, 13, sometimes quite nervous of them already. The younger ones, much, much less so. Teachers, really nervous of them very often. You know, you put um, many, many teachers in a piggery with a <laughs> boar rearing up uh, to say hello and slobbering. Um, um, a lot of teachers will, will back away. I'm sure there are teachers whose pupils would like to put them in a Absolutely. degree. <laughs> anyway, it's, um, what I've watched is these, the, the, the extraordinary thing of children and the effect they have on the animals and the effect the animals have on them. And you realise there's a, a real interest in, uh, and the fear dissipates very, very quickly on both sides. So time and time again, for instance, again with horses, which we have on the farm, or cows, you can walk into a barn, I can walk into a barn, sort of big, with a noisy voice, and they'll all go, whoa, and they'll go off to a far corner, or they'll turn their back on you. If a small child walks in, interesting, interesting. there's no threat. Mm. And if the child speaks in a still, small voice, which children often do, particularly if they're told that's a good idea, you feel the animals calming, and they calm each other. And the number of upset children, really upset children, we have many of them who come to the farm, who will put their hand on a, a horse's neck and have enormous comfort from this proximity and trust and affection uh, through touch, which you almost can't do. The last time for a lot of children may have been a, a mother who really loved them to have this kind of um, sensitivity about touch. So that's what it is. I've witnessed that I've been in this wonderful position of knowing that there is this extraordinary connection between us. And so stories, one story after whether it's an elephant or it's a, a tiger or, or a horse. I don't, I'm trying to work out which animals I haven't <laughs> exploited in this way in my book. <laughs> Octopuses are meant to be very intelligent, aren't they? I better you get on with that. You have done an octopus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Slightly trickier. Yeah, yeah. Being eight, in the water. Yeah, eight legs. <laughs> Mind you, I saw one the other day. It was interesting. Out in, it's interesting you said. And this is what happens actually. People mention something. You suddenly realise. Hang on. There's a, there's a point here. I, mean, I was on the by the beach the other day in, uh, in Ithaca, and there was a beautiful family who came down to bathe at five o'clock every evening. There was there was granny. There was great grandpa. Uh, there was mum, there was dad, I don't know how many kids. And they just loved, they came to the same place every single day. And the daddy of the family had reached under this little sort of jetty thing and come out with this octopus wrapped around his fingers. Now the normal thing if that happened in England is everyone was screamed and run away. And of course these kids are so used to the whole thing, they're so used to the little fish, mm -hmm. so they all wanted to touch it and you could see <laughs> And I knew that octopus was going to end up in the pot <laughs> that night. And so I said to him the next day, did the, did the octopus taste good? And he said, what? I said, did it taste good? I didn't eat it. He said, it was a nice one. <laughs> I thought it was sweet. <laughs> it was a friendly one. It was a friendly one. <laughs>